McCoy is there, and he gives an Intel spill. I mean, reading, it could read, be Modulo read. 2 Pi if we're going weird. Why would you do that? <laughs> Why? Then how did they stop here? Okay, so this is tactical slap type B. Where was yeah. Earth's defenses? Okay, this, this is what happened oh. to her dad. This is what happened to her dad a few, like a few hours ago. So, Captain Kirk, Spock, Uhura go down to Kronos. First off, what are they doing? This is not unforeseen. Like, they said it was uninhabited, but... It is. It's it's habited. They know it's we habited. Being pursued by a D4 class Klingon vessel. I thought the sector was abandoned. It must be a random patrol. It's crazy that you're on a planet. Why would you expect zero people to be in an area? Like you could say it's uninhabited right. or like abandoned, right. but that's not the same thing. Right. We're not like up in a mountain somewhere. You heck, even canyon. Like there might be people down there. We're in like an abandoned city, but abandoned cities aren't really that abandoned. There could be homeless people. Right. It, it takes one homeless person to be like, uh, I see an alien ship. Please come help. Mm -hmm. And then to not expect the military to patrol at all in an abandoned area just mm -hmm. to keep an eye on things. I mean, mm -hmm. they're like, I thought there was going to be nobody here. What? I didn't do ask any follow-up questions. This is not unforeseen. This is easily foreseen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go to a highly warlike people's planet and expect them not to have warships ready. Right, just just even just regular patrols. Even if it is truly uninhabited and abandoned, you would mm -hmm. expect patrols to keep an eye on it mm -hmm. as they're dismantling it, maybe. Yeah. Kirk. Strategically unwise. Unforeseen yep. because they didn't look. But, like, you're going to a planet. There's, there's, there's no real, there's no good ex expectation that this place should actually be abandoned. That's right. Actually, why don't they just scan it with, with, Enterprises scanners, not that they're closer. I don't. I did they scan it at all, or they just be like, they did. Admiral Marcus told me it was abandoned, therefore I should encounter nobody without any double checking. Laser focused on the mission to the point where <laughs> they almost lost the mission. That's right. <laughs> and then they get chased, and then they mm -hmm. sort of wiggle their way through this crack between the abandoned buildings. Would this be fatal? Classic Millennium Falcon. Oh, so would it be fatal? I mean, it's they're, they're skipping along the walls, which in principle is skipping, it's glancing, so maybe okay. Mm -hmm. Like like if you hit a, your car against the wall, that's that's all bad. But if you like glance off mm -hmm. of it, maybe not okay. Not maybe maybe not mm -hmm. bad. It may be okay. So my estimate of this, when you ask this question, so so here's a ship and it's tall. It's got to be mm -hmm. at least two meters because that's about mm -hmm. how tall people are. So let's call it three, maybe okay. four. This this is what this width is. Yeah. And so my question is. How quickly does this ship, when it when it hits the wall, when it scrapes along the wall, how much is it jostled? How much by by how much is it moved over in a very short amount of time? So, gosh, it's it's metal on metal, right? Right. Which which I'm okay with. Like for example, underneath your truck, you have a skid plate that's designed for metal to hit some to hit something mm -hmm. in the road, and I can bounce right off of it. The question that I have is, is if you're strapped down in your seat and if the entire ship like jostles, what does that do to the person? Right. And so, so when I was looking at this, you get, it scrapes against the wall and you get about maybe a meter of deflection. So your whole yep. ship like drops a meter in a very short amount of time. I think that would mess up a person. I think it would. Cause it's, it's metal. It's a structural metal mm -hmm. hitting structural metal in the ship very this is sort of no, no give no stuff. softness yeah there it is right. it's not like a trampoline which like which you can jump on and it balances you is you're, you're jumping on concrete you're jumping on smash something real hard real fast right, right. so you you get moved say a meter or two mm -hmm. in many many fractions of a second because it's such a hard material mm -hmm. i mean i don't know how many fractions of a like how small but concrete or metal on metal is fast. I mean, given the speed of the ship, which is hard to estimate, but I would mm -hmm. say it's something like tenths or hundredths of a second that you're moving mm -hmm. a meter. Yeah. 
That's a lot of movement real fast. It's a lot of movement real fast. And then it happens again and again and again. Yep. 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 But maybe, (sighs) maybe it's okay. Maybe this ship, which, which was, if I remember, it was like a, a ship that was commandeered from like poachers or something or or smugglers or something. And Mm -hmm. so, but maybe this in the Star Trek universe, they have inertial dampeners. So you can, you can take, you can take like jostles inside the ship. Maybe. So what is it? What does inertial dampening do? It turns down the mass of every, everything inside the ship. Okay. So that not, so that accelerating becomes extremely easy. Okay. Yeah. That means if you get jostled, your entire body moves. Goes with the ship. Easy, goes with the ship. And any acceleration is easily transferred throughout mm-hmm. your body because mm-hmm. the mass is so low. So you just dial down right. the inertia, which allows any large acceleration to not be felt by the body because it's easily right. transferred around. Effectively, you can move with the motion instead of being heavy and slow to the motion. And then there's a lot of force applied to you to make, make right. you move. Or like your, yeah, your organs sitting inside you have to like fall down your rib cage to feel yep. an elasticity so it can be pulled back up. If there's yep. a really low, if there's a really low amount of inertia, then they just stay put, stay put. Whereas if it's high inertia, they, they go down and up. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I think if this ship has inertial dampening, I think I'm okay with it. I'm actually okay. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they actually wouldn't feel much of the jostling inside then. Mm-hmm. They would just sort of feel a little something maybe that's it they just bounce around with the ship but it's not like when you're on a it's, yeah i guess it's like on a when you're on a cruise ship and the ship is bouncing but you bounce with it so it's not bad as right. opposed to if you're on a small boat that's real choppy waves like you can get thrown around on the boat and then you're right. hitting the yeah. wall that, that that's bad mm-hmm. then if you turn down the mass of the ship and every every occupant inside not a problem mm-hmm. just bounce together this is after they capture john harrison who they now know I'm not sure if they know it's Khan yet. I'm not sure. But McCoy is there and he gives an intel spill. Why aren't we moving, Captain? An unexpected malfunction, perhaps in your warp core, conveniently stranding you on the edge of Klingon space. How the hell do you know that, Bones? <sighs> Slipped. So Khan could be totally speculating there, guessing as to what's going on. Now it's confirmed. Mm-hmm. So just because he got it right doesn't mean he knows it's right. So McCoy is saying, how the hell do you know that? That's a spill. Mm-hmm. He that slipped. A spill. I mean, I see why McCoy is there. He's there to take a blood sample, but he needs to be instructed to shut up, <laughs> to, to right. not say anything, not even facial expressions. Because right. for this prisoner, you really want to keep him in the dark. You really want to keep him not knowing what's going on. And no right. one slipped. That's right. So even if he's like 70% sure that's what happened, he's now 90, 99% sure that's what happened. It's a slip. It's a slip. McCoy. Yeah, strategically unwise. But I, but at the same time, I get it because McCoy, he's, he's a doctor. He's mm-hmm. not a command officer, right? It's, 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 um, Kirk, Kirk and Spock mm-hmm. are there. They're the ones like making the Intel decisions. Right. So I think Kirk and Spock should have brought in a nurse or some underling who has not, is not privy to that information and it's just doing their job mm-hmm. and Khan tries to get the information out of him and they're like, I'm just, I'm just taking your blood. I don't know what you want from me. Ah, there it is. That's right. Yep. So I, I think everyone in the ship knows that the ship's not moving. <laughs> right. That's, that's my hunch. Um, they just, they just need explicit instruction. Like this is a person who's very smart. He's going to try to get information out of us. We need to give him nothing. Right. Well, I mean, there's it, the ship's not moving, but there's also more confirmed in what Khan says. Oh, Can we listen one more time. He, he says more stuff. Okay. Let's watch again. Why aren't we moving, Captain? An unexpected malfunction, perhaps in your warp core, conveniently stranding you on the edge of Klingon space. I saw How the hell do you know that, Bones? I see. It's more than just not moving. It's the warp core statement, which Bones knows about. And he's like, how did mm-hmm. you know that you guessed this? But actually, right. I was just speculating. And then you said I was right. Right. Because right. it could be not moving because Kirk said, I'll stop. Mm. That's true. And That's true. Yeah. And... He spilled that there's a malfunction, which is a very different situation than not moving because of a decision. Bones. That's right. Bones. I guess, yeah. In the medical training, he didn't do this type of. I guess it is also Kirk's training. Because he should have brought in a nurse. 
Or you could have had Bones have like a black pillowcase over his head and earmuffs. And so that way Khan could not like read his expressions and earmuffs. Mm-hmm. So that way he wouldn't hear what Khan's saying. That would also be good. There you go. This is the coordinates that Kirk sends to Scotty. It says, go check out. Some, there's something out there. But I was wondering, what are these coordinates? So first glance, I'm seeing four numbers separated by dots. Four numbers to me, first glance, means three space, one time. Okay, okay. So I would think 23, 17, 46 are spatial dimensions. 11 is the time. You, you talking about X, Y, Z, or are you talking about R, Theta, Phi? Uh, based on the numbers, I'm thinking it's got to be X, Y, Z because... They're similar in size, right? 23, 17, 46. Yeah, I guess. Whereas if if it was R, theta, phi, I'm thinking R is going to be enormous. Whereas I mean, theta depending and phi on are going to be restricted scale to... scale of the units are. And then theta, <laughs> phi, yeah. Theta, phi would be restricted to 2 pi and pi. Mm-hmm. So I guess which... it's possible that... Unless, they could be in degrees. So instead of 2 I... pi and pi, it could be 360 and 180. So I think it's possible that they could be the same order of magnitude. I just think it would be unlikely. Yeah. There's um, a narrow window where this is pointing in like the first octant and it's just exactly right. Right. Wait, do you know what I mean by first octant? So they're in 3D space, XYZ coordinates. The XYZ, the, the three planes mm-hmm. split space into eight zones. Perfect. Um. So you're like saying first there's octant. one, two, three, four, mm-hmm. and five, six, seven, eight. That's the, yeah. that's the octants. And first octant is where each coordinate X, Y, Z is positive. Right. And so. smaller than 90. Because that's what all these are. For 90 like degrees. Oh, you're thinking angles. I'm oh, thinking oh, oh also... sorry, sorry. You're, you're still thinking X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Back to X, Y, Z. Then, yeah, these yeah. would all be positive. Mm-hmm. So if it, if it was R theta phi, I'd be expecting large number in the first entry and then degree or radian-like entries in the next two. Um, These can't be radians. Too big. I mean, it could be modulo 2 pi if we're going weird. Why would you do that? (laughs) Like, where is that star? Let me spin around a bunch of times and then divide out that 2 pi. Oh, it's right there. Like, why would you do that? I need you to spin the Enterprise 16 times before we get to the proper bearing. It's like old treasure maps. They're like, turn three times. (laughs) <laughs> like, I'm already looking that way. It can spin yeah. it's the same way. Yeah. Okay. Possible, but I'm going to say extremely unlikely. <laughs> unlikely. I agree with that. Good assessment. <laughs> uh, so I want to say X, Y, Z. Sure. And But that doesn't make any sense because if this is the solar system centered at the sun, sure. you would expect the Z coordinate, which probably is lined up perpendicular to the ecliptic, to be a very small number compared to the other two if you're out at Jupiter. I see what you're saying. So so if you have the sun would be like zero 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 and then at the north star would be like no, no I, that wouldn't be right either. You would put All the, the planets north, would have a very low Z number. They'd all right? be in the in the saucer plate in the in the disk yeah. of the galaxy of yeah. the solar system. It, yeah, it would be like plus or minus some small number compared to like the distance from the sun to Jupiter would be enormous. So you'd expect X and Y to potentially be large. Mm. Tight logic. What else so if it's, if it's X, Y, Z, you're in the first coordinate. Sorry, sorry. You're in the first octant, meaning X, 23, 17 is Y, which is from some arbitrarily chosen X axis, mm. which I guess is pointing towards springtime, I think is what we choose for the X axis. Yep. Um, that seems okay. I guess so then the how does vernal the 40... equinox specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah the, yeah, the vernal equinox, yeah. So then the 46, maybe that is much, much tinier. It's just known that it's a much smaller number. So it's like 23, 230 million, 170 million, and then... 46 40... trillion, but it's like, oh, but the obvious number is 46. Don't worry, don't, we'll drop the units. Super lazy. Yeah, we'll drop I the units. It. So now I hate it. I hate we're like... It so much baking in assumptions about what these coordinates are. I don't like it. 
So it's like one's in me one's in ten to the ninth meters, ten to the ninth meters, ten to the three meters, and seconds 11. from some 11. arbitrary time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know what else this could be. I feel like there's no way we could figure it out because there's it looks like there's too many assumptions baked in. I agree. Not enough information for me to discern different ideas. Just, just not enough. Oh, neat though. Whatever the neat system though. is. Yeah, whatever the system is. Nice and compact. Whole numbers. Whatever the system is, is probably a lot better than the awful security station. Security at that space station. Let's watch how easily they're infiltrated. So pathetic. Mm -hmm. Scotty's coming in hot. Scotty's coming in hot. Looking over the dash of his car. Looking over the hood. Okay. And he's like, he's he's there. He's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. tens of meters away from the surface of this super secret space station. He super secret space station with lots of lights that are just shining out. I mean, I guess, I guess the intensity of the light dies as a function of R squared. So like you go, you go, I guess it gets weaker as a function of distance uh, as with one of R squared. Mm -hmm. And so probably the light signal doesn't get very far, but at the same time, if it's super secret, just cover that up. I don't want people knowing where I am. That's right, because there's not only Starfleet. There's actually cargo vessels, merchant vessels just flying around. They can be like, oh, what's that? You could have the the Ramis doing long-range scanning of you. And the Klingies, yeah. They're so, they're so needy. <laughs> Please acknowledge me with my, my physical strength, my battle. Oh, honor. Okay, let's look a little bit more. My honor. <laughs> I mean, he's right there. He's right there. Oh, so you're saying right there, meaning he's an unauthorized vehicle and he's so close to the space station. The super secret stops, super secret, super top secret space station right. is building this ship and nobody's supposed to know about it, but then this guy can like just walk up to it. Right, it's, it's like, like walking area, up to the Pentagon. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's go, like go, area go. 51. You like walk up to the fence. Okay. Yeah, okay, uh, you guys got change for a dollar? Like, what, what do you you're not supposed to even get that close. <laughs> I, mean, I guess the first fence at Area 51 is like the first fence. If you breach that, you're in trouble. Mm. You can walk up to the fence, but they're probably going to monitor you, right? He's like, he's not at the first fence. He's He's got to be many onion layers like, in, right? He's like sniffing the security guards. <laughs> he got really yeah. close. Okay, it gets worse. Door opens, coincidentally. Door. Many doors open. Entry to construction hangar. Open comms. Open comms, that's right. Not a secure channel. So other ships, he just hops in queue. Just hops in. And gets in. I mean, I get it. I get it from these shuttles. They're like, mm -hmm. we're for some other ship, and yeah. I don't know you. You're not part of our mm -hmm. group, but maybe you're part of this space station. It's like, I'm not going to question it. Like, oh, I don't whatever. Like, I'm going in. I'm going in and do my repair job. Whatever, fine. Right, it's like me trying to cut in the cafeteria line here. Like, whoop, just gonna slip in. Ooh, no problem. Uh, My friend is here. My friend, see, friend, friend. Yeah, that's true. But I, I guess I don't know what the situation is. If, if you're, uh no, I hate it. I hate it. Don't <laughs> cut the line. <laughs> don't cut the line. <laughs> but I have a friend. Friend right here. See, you, nobody knows. But nobody. They, have you ever seen somebody cut a line in the cafeteria and it just sort of happens and everyone just moves on with their day and you're like, oh, I have personally done this. <laughs> oh, no. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It happened at that place in Quebec that I recommended. Yeah, so yeah there were some death stares. And I was like, I'm too oh, deep. No. In, I'm too deep. I can't walk oh, out now. No. <laughs> so Scotty does this and nobody speaks up like it's. Okay, but, but in their defense, line. so they're, they're for some other ship. And they're like, mm -hmm. we're here for the repair job and please open the doors. We're coming in, right? And so I don't know. I'm, I'm just I'm just here visiting to repair. Like, I don't know what the what the workings of your space station is. Like if this guy's turns out to be Scotty, it's coming in from the top and he's doing some repair thing there mm -hmm. and he's done and like the doors open, it's time for him to go in. Like I, I don't I don't know that. Like, sure. I don't. That's true. I mean, as long as you f look like you're supposed to be there, people might not question. And if there's a lot of comings Dangerous. and goings where it's like, I can't ask about every ship that's coming and going. Mm -hmm. eh, that's okay. They'll have it. Somebody's, some security person's figured it out. 
I think that makes a lot of sense for these shuttles that are coming in from that visiting ship. It does mm-hmm. not make sense for whoever's the air traffic controller for the station. There should be an ID tag for every ship that's coming into that door. That's right. And every approaching ship should be questioned. Mm-hmm. And sent or shot, because like, it could be like yeah. a suicide shuttle. It's coming in and just blowing right. stuff up. Not good. Yeah. If you're a visitor, like, hey, there's a visiting, go dock over there and we'll get mm-hmm. you a badge, you a badge. or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so air traffic control, space traffic control, somebody effed up. Effed up. Up, oh, super low security, high secrecy place. But maybe that's their modus operandi to be like, we're so obscure and we don't need to have security because no one's going to come here. But that's a wild gamble. Don't do that's that. A wild just, gamble. Just post one guy with like a radio and be like, who are you? Yeah, I mean, it's like a control tower. Yeah, yeah. In, and in, in fact, in fact, these people are talking to the control tower. That's right. In fact, it's better than a control tower because a control tower is like constrained to be on the surface of a planet. So you get mm-hmm. limited view. You could just put a space station in orbit of Jupiter that can get a full view of the whole situation. You know, I like it. I like it. Throw, throw, throw a satellite around the moon. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of these scenes that felt like Scotty should not have been able to get in here. Section 31 is supposed to be badass and he just he just rolls in. He just rolls in. Oh, well. This is this was a weird scene because I know who Khan is because I've seen The Wrath of Khan. But mm-hmm. how do Kirk and Spock know who Khan is? He like he who drops this, his name. Who the hell are you? My name is Khan. Who? <laughs> I mean, yeah. He says. See, first of all, he he only says his first name. Like, like, what are you? Right. Like the Rock? Like, what do you like? Share? Like, what do you get? A, you only got Bono. You got like one name. Like, <laughs> but that that only makes that, that only works if you have enough celebrity around you where people know right. you by your first name and your singular first name only. Mm-hmm. And so this is the this is an interesting calculation on Consick mm-hmm. where he's like, they're going to know me if I just say my, my first name. Like, I'm going to be super important. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, it's Con. Like, but they don't know who he is. Right. He's thinking like, oh, through the annals of history, they'll learn about me in grade school and I'll drop my name. But like, Mm -hmm. actually, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember (laughs) in theaters, people, it it was the, there's like this pause here was like, I'm con. They're expecting the audience to be like, oh my gosh. And it was dead silent because if you weren't an already existing Star Trek fan who had seen the Wrath of Khan or at least somehow knew Mm -hmm. the lore about Khan, then who is this guy? Like, that's the first time they say his name as Khan. He's, he's John Morris. That's right. That's right. So the the audience is made up of some people who haven't seen the old movies. I mean, they were, this came out in like 2013 mm-hmm. and the Wrath of Khan, I think was like 84 or something. It's pretty mm-hmm. far in the past. So dropping this name, it was like, what? What? Who is this? And okay. Then, and then in the, in the story, it's a struggle because Kirk doesn't know who Khan is at this point. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm Khan. And for, okay, in the story, in the universe, in the fiction, both Kirk and Spock are like, who? Who is this? Who? Right? It's like, my name is Jimmy. Oh. Oh. Hi, hi Jimmy. Very, very intimidating. <laughs> I like the way you said it. But yeah. who are you? Who, uh, who are you? Jimmy. Short for Jimothy. Like, uh, okay. Like, <laughs> Yeah, weird, weird, scene. weird scene, weird scene, weird scene. But a cool part of the scene is the ethics of deep space exile. And so there's, there's historically when people were exiled, if you were in a small group, if you were like just you by yourself, like that's pretty much a death sentence. Like you get sent out okay. to the force somewhere, unless you already know how to survive by yourself, then then you're in, you're in trouble. And so I think that's what they were doing here, where where Khan was exiled by with his people, and they're effectively effectively Starfleet saying like we don't want to kill people, we're just going to throw you out into space. But mm-hmm. that's really different. Who the hell are you? A remnant of a time long path, genetically engineered to be superior, to lead others to peace in a world at war. We were condemned as criminals, forced into exile. For centuries we slept. 
but as a result of the destruction of Vulcan, your Starfleet began to aggressively search distant quadrants of space. My ship was found adrift. So two things in here, but let's get them one at a time. So Khan and his people were genetically engineered because they're supposed to lead humanity to a brighter future. Um, but for whatever reason, not explained in this movie, they were deemed as to be bad people and they're like mm -hmm. thrown away from the earth. Okay, so my thoughts are, what are the ethics of this? Because because if you, in the olden days, in the 1400s or three, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, like, like if you throw one person out of the village, that's pretty much a death sentence because uh -huh. unless they already know how to do survival skills, then they're not going to be able to get shelter. They're not going to be able to find food. They're not going to be able to build a civilization themselves. If you sent out a group of people, and so, so you've effectively killed them, but in a way that doesn't feel bad for you, but you effectively killed them. If you right. send out a group of people that's like, 40, 40 or so people, you exile them as a group, that, that group of people might stand a chance of building a new civilization. They build up their own colony. So you haven't, you haven't killed them, but you've just said like, don't be here. Like we don't want you around. Right? And then on, on the larger scale, if you were to exile like 10,000 people overnight, like that's pretty much a death sentence for a good chunk of them because no way are they going to be able to have that support structure, the, the infrastructure in order to feed and, and house and clothe all those people immediately. Right? Okay, but that's all. Be that's 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 the, I guess the rules, like the the overall idea of, of exiling people that actually live in the moment. When you exile people that are frozen in pods, you're effectively just throwing them into space, and and who knows what happens to them. And so, if they're never woken up again, or they crash on a planet, or their freezers break, you've effectively killed them without killing them so you don't feel it but but you really did um even, even if they do wake up you've now thrown them into a future in which case they're like what is this world that i've been around like i i see that i'm no longer in the same world as all the people that i grew up with but also i went to sleep and woke up like i didn't feel any exile like i just i'm in a different place and then there's also the issue of if, if Khan and his people were found drifting in space, but what if they had landed on an alien planet and then endeared themselves to the Incarn, endeared themselves to the people, and then came back to Earth to, to seek vengeance? For example, as what is happening here, and so it's a uh, yeah, it's interesting choice by Starfleet to effectively kill people in space, hmm. but maybe not with a risk that they come back. If, weird ethics. Yeah, why not? freeze them but leave them in a warehouse on earth so i think the reason they don't do that is because it now feels like i'm imprisoning someone and i'm like reminded of their body there that they're frozen and that i'm a bad person so you you throw them away you throw them out of the space you'd be like not my problem done so then it becomes a matter of record keeping at that point because if you jettison the frozen people in a ship out into space adrift well you can track that trajectory pretty straightforwardly. And yeah. so when Starfleet levels up its game to be like, okay, we are no longer in the fear mode. We're more ethically directed. Mm -hmm. Let's go get the ship because we know where it is because we know the trajectory we sent it out on. So get it, bring it back. We can either warehouse them or unfreeze them and deal with their immorality pretty easily. Um, but instead they leave them drifting yeah that's weird it's weird it's a weird forever punishment that the person doesn't feel until they're unfrozen because if if they just die in the frozen thing well their non-existence continues right if they wake up they don't feel any of the effects of being in exile for 200 years because they didn't experience it right so there's no like i don't know mental problems because of that there's essentially no punishment Plus, he has all his friends. <laughs> That's right. And as long as you have your friends, isn't that all that matters? That's all that matters. Friends. Right. Friends, friends forever. Yeah, weird scene. Yeah. Oh, but the good thing about this is right at the end, Khan says, because of the attack on Vulcan, Starfleet is now aggressively expanding out to space. Mm -hmm. And so is this why is this why the Enterprise goes on a five year mission? Because five year mission is is weird thing, mm -hmm. right? It's like we don't right. send ships out like that. But maybe because Vulcan was attacked by Nero in the first movie, 
then then Starfleet's like, we need to know. We need to know what's out there. Mm-hmm. So expand aggressively. Maybe that's also why Starfleet's so weak, why Starfleet has so few ships, because stuff is out. Stuff is out in the space. But as a result of the destruction of Vulcan, your Starfleet began to aggressively search distant quadrants of space. My ship was found adrift. Neat. I mean, this is kind of maybe in the original series, they're like, we're going to do the five year mission for exploration purposes. And secondarily, we get to learn what's out there, maybe get some new tech. There'll be some military applications. Maybe in the mm-hmm. Kelvin timeline with the fear, the primary one is military and tech, and secondarily, exploration. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like I can see that. It makes sense to me. I mean, they're all similar in vain. Similar, but yeah. Different motivation. Gosh, this felt like a contrived reason that Admiral Marcus came up with on the spot to not explain to Kirk why there were people in the tubes. He wants to he, ease Kirk's burden. He's charming. And what exactly would you like me to do with the rest of his crew, sir? Fire them at the Klingons, end 72 lives, start a war in the process? He put those people in those torpedoes. And I simply didn't want to burden you with knowing what was inside of them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. It's like, that is a pretty bad explanation. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. It's like, Khan put those people inside the torpedoes, and I put them in your ship. It's like, what? (laughs) Yeah, what's in the refrigerator? Well, don't, I don't want to. I don't want to burden you with what's in the refrigerator. Just don't even ask. I'll open it. But there is there is some. I mean, I'm not in the military, but there is some type of if need to know stuff, right? Like if mm-hmm. you're if you're the actual person holding the rifle, you maybe you don't need to know what's going on with the greater strategic of the entire continent, right? Right. Mm-hmm. There's there's different levels of knowledge required for different tasks. So there is there is something here that 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 Marcus is saying to Kirk. But if you didn't need to know, then it's a security breach. And he didn't say you didn't need to know. He said, "I'm easing your burden," which means yeah, he should just like, yeah. He was just making stuff up on the fly, he's and he should stuff have on told the fly. Kirk. <laughs> hey, That's hey, right. he's trying to he's trying to sell it to the bitter end, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's really, really going. Good for him. Good for him. He does have the he does have Starfleet and uh, the Federation's best interests at heart, even if True. we disagree with it. Yeah. You know, he's thinking military is the way to go. We got to get this done. And if you think that the that war with the Klingon Empire is inevitable, then yeah, you want to be strong. You want to be strong. Yeah. So you build the ship in secret, so that way it's mm-hmm. ready when you need to. Mm-hmm. This this is after the chase, and. The uh, USS what, Vengeance mm-hmm. takes the Enterprise out of warp with its weapons. But doesn't that mean it shouldn't be close to Earth? I got confused on the distances here. The distances don't make sense. <laughs> super scary, but super cool. We're 237,000 kilometers from Earth. So they're at moon distance. All right. So does that mean the Enterprise was planning on going past Earth? Because if he got, they got shot out of warp, that means they That's fell right. out of warp at Earth. I mean, Moon is so close to Earth, it might as well be Earth. Right. That they were essentially planning on going past Earth. You're saying because they, you're saying that the Enterprise was already was not going to exit at warp. They got they got forcibly removed from warp. Right. When when Marcus shot them out. Right. So if they were if they weren't already coming to a stop, then how did they stop here? Right. Does that mean they were planning to overshoot? I mean, I guess they had to have been because light speed from moon to earth is about one to two seconds, I think. So if you're going to warp, which is faster than light speed, it's less than that. So Sulu has like <laughs> sub <laughs> sub nanosecond, like stop, <laughs> stop. <laughs> so I think that means they must have been going past earth. Maybe they're trying to draw the vengeance away from earth. Maybe, 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 I don't know. Maybe. The thing that really bothered me about this scene was how quick it was. So for for the Enterprise to go from Earth out to Klingon, to no, not Klingon, to Klingon what's the space. planet? It was the edge Klingon of Klingon space. space. But the so the home world fire at Kronos. Kronos, thank you. For mm-hmm. so for for the Enterprise to go from Earth to Kronos, it was at least several hours because they mm-hmm. had time to like arrange stuff on the ship and talk and I don't know whatever str- strategic they have. Mm-hmm. Um, but then on the way back, they they left Kronos 
and then within a few minutes the vengeance here is attacking attacking mm -hmm. the enterprise so it was somehow really close yeah so those what? that's a discrepancy in time so it should be Klingon Empire should be fairly far away and at warp five which I think the original enterprise goes at mm -hmm. I think it's a long time it could be even be days I mean it needs to be at least as far as it was to get there that's right and they just certainly felt like when they were going out to the edge of Klingon space it took a long time Mm -hmm. at least a day something like that they had mm -hmm. at least hours to like wander around do discussions they had time out. to change uniforms and get into that pirate mm -hmm. ship that's right it's and super then weird. when they come back it's minutes but minutes there wasn't a hot swap of the enterprise's engines you know yeah it didn't <laughs> so, get it didn't get upgraded so how is the ship faster now weird it, yeah yeah it doesn't make but I, sense. I guess I get it because you can't have like a I can't have the USS Vengeance has been chasing us for three days like but weird weird concept. maybe there was of, a time skip I don't I don't know I don't know weird scene I don't know. I didn't, didn't, it was very weird to me ah Kirk gets humbled because of he has a spate a, a, a sequence of decisions which really hurt the crew and the ship um, and so he's learning a little bit of humbleness, like he can make mistakes. But the takeaway for me was when you're young and brash, be arrogant, cheat, make mistakes, you know, shoot for the shoot a uh, high, shoot high, and then learn a little bit of sprinkling some humbleness later. later. Don't do the opposite. Don't do exactly the opposite. Right. Yeah. It is my function aboard this ship to advise you in making the wisest decisions possible, something I firmly believe you are incapable of doing in this moment. You're right. What I'm about to do, it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. It is a gut feeling. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I only know what I can do. The Enterprise and her crew need someone in that chair that knows what he's doing. And it's not me. It's you, Spock. So now, now I've got a little bit of confidence hit there, Kirk. So once you've you know, broken the rules, bent the rules, cheated talked back to people stepped on people's heads now you're at the captain of the enterprise oh now oh oh now uh I, look how I, humble i, I, I am. should step back i'm so humble right, right, right but you're already the captain of the enterprise so that's right shoot to the top and then bring it back right because i mean if you if he did not shoot to the top and then bring it back to be humble then he would just be a depressed person <laughs> right? like because like, if because if there's plenty of people that are humble on the ship they're just not captains like they're just random people in the background of the ship they don't have they're they're not right. cocky enough they're not cock right. full they're not cockalicious they're not, they're not cockalicious enough to like to swing with the fences to do the dangerous stuff to do the braggadocious stuff that that uh, that kirk does so i guess i guess this is actually a very good lesson actually like a life lesson is be a bit cocky, like be a bit cocky and try some stuff that's risky. As long as it's not really offensive, as long as you mm -hmm. can skirt the lines and get through there on charisma mm -hmm. and charm, then yeah, yeah, go for it. Because then when you're super high up on the clouds, you're top, you're top of your game, you're number one, then you'd be like, oh, I'm humble. You know, I just want to yeah. have a you know, yeah. nice relaxed night tonight. Because like, right. if, if, you, if you're humble from the beginning, right out of Starflight Academy, yeah. humble, 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 humble. Now you're like a lowly lieutenant. You're like, turn on the arrogance a little bit. People are like, oh, good, you're you've like, learned arrogance, but... <laughs> You're not Captain Kirk. Right. Good job. Good job. I mean, good, good, good for him to be a little bit less arrogant, but good. I think the overall lesson is to be arrogant. Be arrogant. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we are here in mm -hmm. the medical bay. Yeah, the medical bay. And okay. Bones. Bones is here. Is he's doing tests for for triples, but but it's really it's just really not the time to be doing this, Bones. Bones, what are you doing with that triple? The triple's dead. I'm injecting Khan's platelets into the deceased tissue of the necrotic host. Khan's cells regenerate like nothing I've ever seen, and I want to know why. Yeah, so super cool, super interesting, scientifically so, so, very very good. So what's wrong with this? He's doing okay. experiments. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Science is super important. Science is great. And Khan has his magic blood. That's that's awesome. But the weird thing is, when does this happen in the movie? It happens right after the the Vengeance shot the Enterprise out of warp. And so there's like this, this is, this is an explosion. This is a hull breach. And, and it, let's get some more. There's, there's hull breaches here. There's fire there. And so, and there's, there are people getting sucked out. 
And so some, I mean, they're, they're gone. They're, they're dead. Nothing you can do. Mm-hmm. They're out in space somewhere unless someone can beam them in, I guess. Um, but there's certainly people that are injured. And so what is our chief medical officer doing? He's in here doing experiments. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, so I mean, he should, he, should he, should be, pr- he should at least be managing the other medical staff, doing triage, taking care of the people. But he's here. He's off of here doing doing science. Like, what are you, what are you doing, dude? I mean, he is the chief, and this is essentially going to become an ER. Yep. And so he, people are going to be looking to him to like manage the situation. Yep. Like you said, do triage, get nurses, other doctors, getting into places they need to be. Prepping for injuries mm-hmm. that he's seen before. Prepping for surgery. He's the head surgeon. Yeah. And none of that includes quick Playing experiments triples. on triples. Right. right. I mean, but I, I get it. I get it. I get why he's doing this and why this needs to happen because they need the the con's blood to reset to do a Lazarus on 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 this triple to bring it back to life because then later on you can save Kirk. But it's just why like what, this this is. But he doesn't know that's going to be the outcome of the injection. Right. He's doing it because it's it could turn out to be something interesting, but it probably won't. And so the pressing matter is injured crew. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm all down for exploratory science. I'm literally this is my, this is my career, mm-hmm. but not in this situation. <laughs> there, there are people yeah. that are that are dead or dying on a ship, and the chief medical officer has a duty to take care of them. Get some other science person to take care of it. I mean, that's so condescending. <laughs> there I mean, are actually, other science officers. Yeah. Get, put sell somebody else on it because people are going to be looking to you for incoming yep. and handling that. Yep. <sighs> Weird. It, it's, the more I think about it now, the weirder that gets. So Kirk and Khan get into this, uh, I don't know, place that they're going to shoot themselves out um, mm-hmm. of the Enterprise and dock. An airlock? Not dock, but it's an airlock. Go. So, so they go- they go from an airlock on the Enterprise, and then they get shot out. And they like fly through debris space, and they're trying to get into a different airlock in the Vengeance. That's right. And the gas transfers momentum to them, so they go flying out of the airlock on the Enterprise. It seems like they pick up a lot of speed. Doesn't seem reasonable, right? Right. One. Oh. That's fast. So I, I want to say that the gas is not the primary reason they pick up momentum that fast. Okay. Because I feel I have this intuition that like the air is going to push them, but also primarily go around them. I agree to it, that. It, it, it doesn't have a lot of time to do a lot of work on them. Mm-hmm. So you're saying so, there's some amount of gas that's going to be behind them. Yeah. And so when this prefer, pressure differential opens up, the, the gas responds to the pressure differential and gets sucked out into space. Some That's portion right. of that gas is going to push them, but I, I just have a hunch. I get, I, I've not done this calculation. Mm-hmm. It feels like most of the gas would just go around them. Go around them. They get pushed a little bit. They may slowly go outside the door. Or even fast, but not this fast. Not this fast, yeah. So I think that means, did they get like a kick? I don't see a kick. That's a hard kick. Some type of like repulsor or something that shoots them forward. Could be. Maybe. It's some kind of electromagnetic thing. And the gas is irrelevant to the propulsion. It's some kind of... I mean, they are in like a cylindrical shape. Maybe it's some kind of magnetic push. A little solenoid action. A little solenoid action. Maybe. Changing magnetic fields corresponding to uh, something in their suit that pushes them out like a rail gun. Maybe. Nice and smooth so they don't get yeah. jostled too much. They don't get liquefied inside their suits. Yeah, <laughs> it's got to be, it's gotta be <laughs> fast, but not too fast, not unhumanly mm-hmm. fast. I think that, that's that got to be the explanation because it's way too fast if it's just gas it's, doing them. Let's work. watch it full speed. Boom. That's fast. That's fast. way too much acceleration. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. And then on the other side, mm. when they get onto the uh, the vengeance, the floor does some work. Slows them down. Comes in. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of floor. 
If I do I mean, some first work, off, you mean you mean the floor is what's stopping them? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So the floor exerts friction force on them against their motion across okay. a super long distance. Yeah. So that's, that's a lot of work. Deals. So for the oh, gas you momentum, mean, you mean actual physics work? You mean <laughs> yeah. Force times distance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The friction force times the distance that they're. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the gas. So in the pre, when they got accelerated out of the Enterprise, it happened mm -hmm. quick. Okay. Here, they accelerate down back down to zero relative speed to the Vengeance, and they do it over a huge distance. They slide to a stop, and and, 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 slide. Some, and some tumbling, and some tumbly stuff, which thankfully yeah. doesn't break any bones. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Good thing this cargo bay or whatever this is is like ultra long. My God. And like polished, smooth, slick, mm -hmm. <laughs> not like mm -hmm. finely textured concrete. So I guess like from from your yeah, motorcycle stuff, mm -hmm. if even if you slide on the concrete, if it's bare skin, you just you just it's just sandpaper, just scraping away skin. So you're supposed to have like the right armor at the right location, so that way you slide on the concrete as opposed yeah. to you know, tearing stuff. Yeah, and, and there's no stuff. It's really bad too. Yeah, and there's no like errant box. Like some some guy oh, yeah. shift ended and he put the box right down in the middle. Yeah. They were lucky. Super lucky. What I thought about this scene was just like how the air shot them out. So yep. here, when this door opens, there should be air rushing out, out of the page, right? mm -hmm. towards us, right? And so that's in exactly anti-parallel, exactly, exactly mm -hmm. opposite direction in which they're shooting. So like here, here's where the highest, mm -hmm. the highest current, I guess, the most momentum of air, which is where the air is going to be whooshing out the most, just like a balloon. And so I would imagine there's a huge portion of their deceleration right mm -hmm. there. And then and once you're inside, it's like slower air. And this isn't like an explosive decompression where it's a sudden burst of air and then it's done. Yeah. Because the vengeance is so large, it's a sustained wind. Mm-hmm. So, which when you're you're going in a headwinds, just like when you're riding your bicycle against the wind, mm -hmm. like that's, a, that's an appreciable force. Like it slows right. you down. So, they must have been they must have been slowed down significantly when they go went through the hole. I that's so. a lot of air. Yeah, you can even like see how much it's flowing. Right. When and has the wind the air been was... so strong in my real life that I've seen it? <laughs> yeah. And even if the air was still, it's still mm -hmm. that's a lot. It's thick air. It slows you right. down. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're skydiving and you're falling, you can't get much over 200 miles an hour, I don't think. Whatever the terminal so, velocity is, yeah. Yeah. So it's slowing. It's doing some serious friction work on work. you. Work. Doing some work. Work, 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 work. So maybe this isn't as dangerous as it looks. The air slowed them down quite a lot. And then the floor, mm. well, it's fun. Mm. <laughs> I still like one of these, one of these, like, um, pull the handle and it puffs up you get a ball you know <laughs> ball, like you roll uh, all yeah. the way that would be nice i think it would have been optimal if they hadn't gone into the tumble mode if they've been able to slide yeah. the whole way i think that's right i think they would have been better so I when think you they... tumble there's risks that you like catch an elbow wrong and then it dislocates right. your arm or... right. um and then when i see like moto gp like the professional mm -hmm. race motorcyclists they yeah these tracks are super wide and flat so if you slide out or even even if you're high side it's mostly sliding, not like tumbling. Tumbling, yeah. Gosh, they're lucky. Super lucky. Oh, and they also didn't run into Scotty. That's right. That's perfect. I mean, right right to the control panel. They could have crushed Dialed him too. In. Dialed in. Well, I mean, if they, had come too, looking... come in, if they had come in too fast, they could have slammed into the control panel and they'd be toast. Yeah. Just broken bones. Lots of it. Mm. Okay, so this is tactical slap type B. So here is Carol and Carol Marcus. And Marcus, he has a first name, but he's the he's the admiral that's not nice. And so um, yeah, she slaps him, but I thought it was really a bad move. Mm -hmm. uh, evasive maneuvers! Everybody on this ship is going to die if you don't let me speak to him. Okay. Sir, it's me, it's Carol. So, so the ship's safety and everyone aboard it, they're... they're safety is carol talking to marcus and carol's carol's way to get Presence. marcus to carol's way that she gets marcus to not kill everyone is emotional leverage she's like you love me i'm your daughter don't kill everyone what are you doing on that ship i don't believe that the man who raised me is capable 
of destroying a ship full of innocent people. If I'm wrong okay. about that, okay. then you're going to have to do it with me on board. Actually, Carol, I won't. Oh. Boom. <clears throat> Boom. Do you... I'll deal with you in a minute. I am ashamed to be your daughter. Okay, I agree with her emotionally, like moral high ground, like you're a bad person, daddy. But also, if she wants to protect everyone in the Enterprise, the best move she can do is to maintain that relationship with the father. As soon as she slaps him, then he's like, like, F you, I'm, I'm going to listen to you anymore. Like, go, go sit in the jail cell, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the optimal route is to put your personal feelings aside yep. and try to manipulate Admiral Marcus into doing what she wants. And by slapping him, she has closed that door. Yep. No ingratiation. In fact, it's, it's just, no, I'm not listening to you anymore. You're a spoiled kid. I just saved so, your life. So, so it feels good for her to do that because she's so right. angry. But in terms of what she wants to get done, which is save the crew of the Enterprise, she can't. Yep. Just she's emotionally move. compromised. Bad move. Yep. I agree with that. I never noticed that before. Solid bitch slap, though. Mm -hmm. Super solid. Yeah, got him. Oh, yeah, so this on the Enterprise, they have these containers marked with a radioactive symbol. Why would the Enterprise have so many, or just so many, and such huge storage tanks of radioactive liquid? Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know. So yeah, I, I agree that they're probably liquid mm -hmm. because of the pipes that go into it. <laughs> I yep. guess they could be like grain silos. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I lived in the Midwest. This looks like a grain silo. So, so mm -hmm. they're probably liquid. That's my hunch. Yeah. And so why would it be a radioactive liquid? Again, my hunch is that the warp core, maybe this is early on in Starfleet's warp core technology. Like it's still the yep. Enterprise a or, or b maybe and and so maybe they've not dialed in the efficiency and so mm -hmm. it's it's like it's like burning a furnace and just it's just too hot because they've not figured out how to like dial in the airflow and so within all that waste energy you need to cool the warp core otherwise it'll actually overheat and destroy itself um and so then maybe these is water maybe these are water tanks that you run over the warp core so that way it doesn't overheat i i'm, I'm modeling this over nuclear reactors right, where right. you have nuclear reactors that will overheat and melt themselves so you pass deuterium you pass heavy water that's that's water with with hydrogens that have extra nitrogens because they're very good at absorbing alpha particles and so but that means you need to have it on a separate water circuit because you can't put that water back into the city and so then you have water that's at least temporarily activated slightly radioactive for a little bit and yeah I guess, I guess that's what this is. So this is coolant that's slightly radioactive, doesn't need to have huge protection, but it should be stored and marked separately. We need a lot of it because our cooling mechanisms aren't super efficient right now. And there, because the, the warp drive itself is not efficient, it's overproducing energy. Right. And so this is the storage location for yes. the cooling water. I like it, I like it. Sounds good to me. Because this is a lot of water. It's a lot, mm. of, a lot of cooling. A lot of infrastructure, a lot of mass. I, I would be, yeah, right. Like, it, I don't even, I have no idea what the scale is of the enterprise. Like, <laughs> where is this room? Like, they always right. like, here's the warp core, and it's like a single room, and then there's this giant thing here. I guess that's, I guess, yeah, that's more to the statement of, of like when we're in the enterprise for Picard, the enterprise, I think that's a D. The warp yeah. core is like a, like a two yeah. floored room. ballroom. Like, that, that's it. Right. Like, it's, it's compact, it's tight, and efficient. Maybe this and, is stuff is humans have not really figured out how warp, cor warp cores yet work. Right. Work yet. Makes sense. So the next generation is farther in the future. And so oh, it's the next generation. Yeah. So they make things, you know, tighter, more efficient. So all this cooling requirement is not needed anymore. I like it. I guess. Anything else? What else could this be? That's the best explanation, I think. Why Second else would you to radioactive grain? <laughs> <laughs> I guess what if it's the fuel? Oh yeah, it could be that. It could be like um yeah, heck yeah. Okay, let's let's mush those ideas together. The the fuel for the warp core could be radio radioactive or radio mm -hmm. close to active grain pellets. And so you would use a like a you pellets, like so you use a grain silo because that's okay. how you could transport these little pellets around. Yeah, maybe. Okay. And then they're in radioactive containers to keep it you know, isolated, but you also need a lot of it. So 
Mm. We store them here. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, maybe. Hmm. Interesting. It looks precarious to work here, though. It does, yeah. Man, I would shoot, if I was an enemy and I wanted to shoot the Enterprise, this is a spot. Yep. I'd want to Yeah. Hit. Even if you destroy my ship, but your, your ship, your crewmate has to breathe all this, that seems like a bad time. Right. Or if it's fuel, I give her to their fuel. If it's coolant, Ooh. well, even better, make them blow Ooh. up. Yep. Seems fragile. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is a weird scene. They, they fall back down to Earth. Uh, Sulu says that if they don't get the reactor back online, they're going to burn up. But they're clearly in the atmosphere without the reactor on. What's going on here? So they're falling. Falling? Okay. 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 Not good, but nothing wrong. If we don't get power or shields back online, we're going to be incinerated on re-entry. So they're going to be burned up. Here they are burning up. They're re-entering right now. Yep. Hitting that atmosphere. In the atmosphere. This, this is burn up territory. They're actually in the atmosphere. So, then they slow down. I mean, they're deep in the atmosphere. That's right. I mean, they're deeply into aerodynamics territory. Oh, so good. Well, I think Sulu was just wrong. Cor yeah, objectively correct because they didn't have they didn't have warp core mm -hmm. on while they were already in the atmosphere, which Sulu said that they would incinerate. Oh, I guess we hey, let's burnt incinerate, right? Okay. If he says we're going to take you know thermal damage when we re-enter, that's different than saying we're going to be incinerated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but look, look, ins the little burn spots. That's incinerated. I mean, if I am cooking and I accidentally touch the oven and I get a big burn on my hand, I wouldn't go to somebody and be like, I was incinerated in the kitchen yesterday. Like, I'm talking to you. Okay, but what if your hand caught fire a little bit? That's incinerated now, right? I, I, I feel like my hand needs to be gone. I can't. <laughs> it needs to turn to ash. Okay, okay, yeah. Right, right. Like if I say incinerate, there are some secret documents. Incinerate those documents. I like light it on the corner, like, <laughs> like sir, sir, mission complete. <laughs> like no, 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 you didn't. No, I want, I want ash. Yeah, <laughs> I think Sulu's just wrong. He just, I think he's just wrong. He's just wrong. Maybe this is an in the field experiment. They thought it would burn up, and it turns out it did not. Yeah, I mean, gosh, you're crashing or whatever, Sulu. But like, accuracy, please, please. Well, maybe the manual said, and now they know. Hmm. Yeah, future ships will be able to dive into atmospheres and know that they won't burn up. That's right. I mean, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and this is Kirk putting the re the core back into place. His mm -hmm. kicks look ineffective. Kick. 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 Many kicks. A really bad kick. And so he's trying to kick it towards the center, mm -hmm. but he's very clearly kicking down, even a little bit outward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. It, so so, you're, so he's trying to line these things up, right? So right. I think the best thing would be to get down on a knee and mm -hmm. shoulder this thing, like, like to push it up. Oh, yeah. I think that would be the way to go, but that's not what he does. He kicks. He does this like hanging kick thing. And you're saying that his force is slightly outward? Well, if you look at one of the kicks, it actually makes the core, the alignment go the wrong direction. Right. You go in here, there. See it? it see in that one? This one right here? It knocks it the wrong direction. Okay. okay. So instead of instead of knocking it, I guess, to the upward direction, that's yep. like <laughs> away from us, it, it knocks it a little bit towards. Okay, let's watch that's it in right. full speed. Yeah, yeah so it... Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, I see what you're saying. He doesn't kick it. It's not like a swinging kick, which would push mm -hmm. it in the right direction. He does this like jabby stuff. And right. given that the pivot point's down here, it actually makes the whole thing rock downward. Okay, let's watch it full speed. Right yeah, I see it. I see it. I, yep. Yeah. I think you're right. He needs to wedge himself in there and leg press it into alignment. Leg press. That's right. Because you get. The legs are the strongest body, body part. Mm -hmm. And with that, you can do a sustained force. 
you can generate yeah. a lot of force and you yeah. know it's in the correct direction whereas this swingy stuff is just all kinds of he does it but it's i don't it know worked, how but it worked but for not the reason he thought it did <laughs> let's watch it let's watch it rock walk towards the bottom of our screen that's the wrong way wrong way that means he's he's trying to tighten something and it worked out to loosen it got lucky got lucky somehow when it like tried to align it sort of aligned itself maybe he jostled it enough that it got loose and then was able to like go back into place possible hmm. I mean, I would, gosh, you really should design this thing to be self-targeting. Like it, the, the more it's on, the more right. it lines itself. Right. So maybe it's just wedged on something. And once he could dislodge it, then it's fine. Then it's maybe. fine. Maybe, th maybe that's what he was doing. He was just dislodging it. In like kind still, of the worst way he could have. <laughs> I still think if it's sort of free to move like this, mm -hmm. I still think the best way is to give lateral forces, not downward like forces. Right. Isn't that going to wedge it worse? It's either, yeah, because instead of doing torque to turn something, you now mm -hmm. do compression. And so you're just packing it in harder. Packing it in harder. I think he got lucky. Super lucky. Big sacrifice, but hey. Save the day. It is. Save the day. Yeah, in fact, you see the one when it does work is when he's a little bit more outside and has an inward kick. Right. And it actually self aligns. Yep. Just got to give it a nudge until yeah. it. Pops into place. Yeah. We'll pop it a pop. Pop, pop. So the USS Vengeance falls to Earth and does some Second. serious damage to San Francisco. I'm not just talking serious, but like extensive. Millions dead, perhaps. Millions. Where was yep. Earth's defenses? Ooh, terrifying. You're watching your death. I came here to do some tours and activities. <laughs> like, this is not what I signed up for. Oh, those people in the buildings have no chance. No chance. No chance in that building. No chance in that building. 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 I don't know the population density, but that is a lot of dead people. Hmm. On the plus side, the <laughs> ship is mostly intact, which is like, hey, good engineering, right? Good engineering, yeah. Like falling from space and crashing and being mostly intact, like, hey, right, taking hey. out what, reinforced concrete, steel buildings, mm -hmm. and not really deforming much. Some surface damage, pretty maybe. Good. Damn. But uh, but but okay. <laughs> Back to your point. Like, like, <laughs> you have you have a spaceship coming down from space onto Earth. Mm -hmm. Where's Earth's defenses? Where, where's the, where's the planetary orbital defense uh, orbital defense right. platforms? Where's other ships being like, oh, this thing's crashing. Let's let's take it apart before it crashes into people. Right. What, what's going on in Starfleet? Because even if it's unforeseen, even if it is a even if it is a Federation ship, it was able to do this much damage. Where mm -hmm. are they? They didn't even try. I mean, do they have track? You know, what is it? Tractor beams at this point? I don't know. I don't I think they've used them in the Kelvin timeline. I mean, do they have missiles, pro proton torpedoes, <laughs> phasers just Fo on the ground or in orbit trying to shoot this thing out of the sky? That's I right. I see it. I guess there is an argument for one large thing is better than millions of little debris, but not when you're going at a city right like right because they just they just take out buildings but it doesn't even look like there's a presence maybe yeah, they decided there, there's hands no, off there's the no best response. thing just let it fall jesus take the wheel jesus <laughs> take the jesus like san francisco you're yeah. toast <laughs> oh, good my. luck that needs to be yeah. a serious debrief Reevaluation of what's I, going on on Earth. I guess this is consistent with what we've been saying about the Kelvin timeline that Starfleet is very weak, that they've not thought about how to defend Earth. I think so. They've had fleet problems, they've had personnel problems, mm -hmm. and now clearly they've got defense of Earth De problems. Like just uh, problems. Defense of Earth against like physical objects, like things that actually here. Right. But okay, it's like a teachable moment. 
<laughs> they can learn from this. Like, Got to watch that's, out for ships falling dude, down. It's a hell of a teachable moment. Yeah. Okay, towards the end of the movie, so this is Carol Marcus, and she's accepted onto the crew by Captain Kirk, and he even says that we're family now. But this is this is like just the, the <laughs> terrible phrasing. Okay, this this is what happened to her dad. This is what happened to her dad a few like a few hours ago. It's nice to have a family. Ah, oh, oh, brutal. Ah, oh, he's oh, so so. Okay. I'm glad you could be a part of the family. It's nice to have a family. I get it. He's like, he's like, I want a tight knit, tight knit crew. Crew, like, we're all family here. But she's like, it's nice to have a family. Like her dad, her dad's head popped. Like I'm, I'm still, I still think about that Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones, like when it was like the mountain versus the viper, and that that, like, ah, and that happened so to her not, dad. Not only is he saying, you know, you're part of this family now, which is kind of disowning her own father. She's got to deal yeah. with all that. Yeah. Yeah. It was this hyper violent death. Hyper like, violent. have you processed all that yet and joined our family? Okay, we're cool. Yeah, I mean, just, just say she's a part of the crew. Grab, grab, grab your hey crewmate, hey crewmate. Grab, glad <laughs> glad to be a part here. of the crew. Hey shipmate, grab, grab you on the team. There's, there's so many other words, but he chose family. Like the one thing that she had, to, like saw her dad's like head pop. Right. So you're a crew member on the bridge here, and you just look at her, and you're like, "What did Kirk, <gasps> Captain Kirk, say to her? Can you, she's can you like imagine breaking that? down." Okay. So, okay, so so there's two. Okay, okay, couple scenarios. If the rest of Starfleet knows about what happened, then they're like. Did he just say something about her dad? Her like her dad's head popped. Like what the fuck? Right, right. But okay, okay. But what if his? What if what if Marcus's death was classified so people don't know? So so they just see Kirk. They see Kirk like, oh, welcome to the family. Good job. Welcome. To, nice to see you here. And then she's like, over the course of the day, like crumbling, like PTSD. <laughs> like like I have not gotten over my head. My dad's head being crushed. Like I loved him. Like the last thing I did to him was slap him in the face. <sighs> And, and said, I'm not proud to be your father. Oh, 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 that's it. You know, in the next movie, Kirk. she's not on the crew. Maybe they got to her. Yep. They got to, I mean, it. I mean, how many people in real life would be able to handle that? I... Yeah. I mean, probably though she quit. I mean, right. I don't think Kirk made her leave. He welcomed her to be the family. And mm. so she quit. Right. And then she voiced some concerns and Kirk was like, I order you not to have concerns. And then she's like, I have to resign. She's like, you quit. You quit. He's like, you quit. You quit. you quit. All I did was every day remind you that you're a part of our family. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you disowned your father yet? Doesn't matter. His head popped. Pop it a pop. Gosh. Kirk. Okay. But I, okay. Okay. But yeah, <laughs> include everyone for family here. Okay. That's great. Yeah. But also phrasing just any oh. other word would have been fine brutal okay that's star trek into darkness so a couple yep. of questions we have is what happened to khan so at the end of the movie we see that he's frozen in the cryo mm -hmm. tube with his 73 friends yep. and so does starfleet just send them back onto space or do they bury I, them in a section 31 bunker and just like you know button it up whatever we're not touching this. i think that's the most reasonable explanation it's like don't send him out to space again that's that didn't work out Put him no. in the bunker, tighten it up. We'll just leave him there. All right. Done. I guess. I guess. Yeah. And then at the end of the movie, they're going to do the five year mission. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is it, but, is, it, is it only the Enterprise that does the five year mission, or is it a bunch of ships that do the five year mission? My guess is that other ships do five year missions. Just wild, wild guess. I have no idea. Speculation. Right. Space is big. Um, space is big. There's lots of vectors, and it's enormous. Uh, my thought about this was, does Kirk get promoted to Admiral? Because a lot of Starfleet officers have died recently. For example, Admiral mm -hmm. Marcus, when when Marcus was there, when they have the meeting right after the bombing in, in yep. Section 31, there's that, that Marcus says, you're the heads of all the nearby ships that are nearby Earth, both the, the captains and the first mm -hmm. officers. And a lot of people in that room died. So, so Starfleet's hurting. So is Kirk going to get promoted? And some captains and head honchos might be killed when the vengeance fell to earth. So even more fell may on have died. Starfleet, just on San Francisco, the Presidio. Yeah. Yeah. So actually he might be fast tracked because they might just be depleted at this point. 
think that does come up see. in the next movie about him oh, going it? to Admiral. I think it does, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. I'm yeah. excited. Next time. Yeah. Next time. See you guys next time.